Hello everyone and welcome to your Glassdoor video report for week 39, 2023. So we're going to be focusing on the mempool, on inscriptions and on the impact on miners today. And the reason that we've opted to look at it today particularly is we've seen that there's been a bunch of these BRC20 text-based inscriptions. And one of these uh, that goes by the ticker SATS um, has essentially finished minting. It's been going since February um, and it's actually finally uh, closed out and, uh, and, and finished that mint process. So over the last seven months, we have seen inscriptions be a significant buyer of block space. And what we're basically going to do is just take a bit of a snapshot of where we are at the end of that kind of period of time, arguably the end of what we're going to call wave two. And then we can really have a bit of a foundation to assess what inscriptions mean for minor revenue, for block, for block rewards, all of these things moving forward. So what we're going to be diving in today is starting from the mempool, which is obviously the first time that the network sees about a transaction. We're going to explore how inscriptions actually show up on chain and really make a differentiation between data size and transaction counts, which is going to be an interesting thing. We'll explore that in more detail. I'm going to help illustrate a bit of a, you know, now that we've got seven months of data, we have a better view on how inscriptions actually buy block space, for want of a better term. And we have a bit of an analogy and a framework on how we can think about them moving forward. And we're going to close out by how this actually looks relative to miners. Now, why this is really important is according to our latest hash rate estimates and block time intervals, the halving is about 206 days away, which means that for you know, for the Bitcoin uh, environment, the halving is obviously a, a significant milestone, but not so much if you're a miner and your revenue is going to get cut in half. So really having a look and seeing, have, have inscriptions and this extra fee revenue actually done anything to offset that? So as always, please do give us a rate, a share, and a subscribe. It does help this channel get to more people. And without further ado, let's get stuck right into the analysis. Okay, so here we are in our week on chain 39 dashboard. And as I said at the start, we are going to begin with the mempool. Now, it's really important to remember that there is no single mempool in Bitcoin. The mempool is individual to each node, and each node has a particular set of rules. Now, this is the glass node mempool, and we have the default 300 megabytes total size. There are other uh, mempools out there and other mempool explorers that will have a much larger to capture more data. In our instance, we're essentially capturing what is the default mempool going to see. Now, there's another important thing to start off with. This first metric up the top here is the total size of transactions. So this is that data footprint. When I talk about the word size in this session, think bytes. How many bytes of data are we talking about? And why this is important, inscriptions really came into the, I mean, they, they were kind of started in February. And this is when it was mostly, this is wave one. And it was mostly images, files, sound files, mostly it was images, kind of that first emergence of ordinals and NFTs on Bitcoin. Now, as we came into May, that actually changed. That footprint has largely become text-based inscriptions. We're going to explore this in a lot more detail. But what you'll see is that note that the data footprint, our mempool was full from a data perspective, you know, arguably with one kind of clearing moment, but our mempool has essentially been full from a data perspective since February. There has been enough data in there, but remember that images are a larger file size to text. So if we now look at this as the same mempool, but it's looking at it in terms of the number of transactions. So just for easy um, uh, kind of computation here, we have a fixed 300 megabyte mempool. Now, if you have a bunch of image files, which are large, you know, a couple of hundred kilobytes, um, those image files are going to be less. You're going to have less of them to fill up that same 300 megabytes. Now, what you can see is that in April and May, this is when text-based inscriptions and these BRC20 token um, uh, things showed up in May. Note that the transactions, we had a full mempool from February in terms of data, but it really filled up in terms of transactions from May onwards, and it's essentially been full ever since. So what this is telling us is that there are more transactions per byte available in the mempool at the current moment. And it really tells you that since May, there's been a dominance of very small transactions all packing into that 300 megabytes. So this first chart here is looking at the number of new inscriptions. Now, back here when these blew up, this was enormous. We were looking at back at, uh, I think when Ordinals first came out, we did a report uh, back in February. And back then it was just all images. And it's almost like the Bitcoin chart. Back then, this was significant and large. 
Well, text-based inscriptions have absolutely blown it out of the water. By far and away, text inscriptions in these BRC20 tokens have been the most significant buyer of block space, um, certainly in terms of transaction count. Now, it gets really interesting. We're going to keep exploring this, but uh, there's a lot of interesting dynamics coming up. So you can see here, this is the percent of how many transactions were confirmed. Now, on the axis here, you can see at the top, we're talking about 60%, 50%, 40%. So images were, you know, let's say seven and a half, five percent, right? They were only buying a small proportion of the overall transactions. The other 95%, you know, thereabouts was the standard monetary transfers that Bitcoin has historically been used for. Now, these text-based inscriptions, remember, they're much smaller in terms of their data footprint. So there's a lot more of them per unit of data, and they have been hitting between 40 and 60% of blocks being full of these transactions. So, and it gets even more interesting than this. Remember, this is on a transaction count basis. If you look at the block, there's lots and lots and lots of these transactions. But as we can see here, they're significantly smaller. You can fit a lot more text-based inscriptions in the same space as a standard monetary or a standard uh, or a, um, a text uh, image-based inscription, sorry. So there's kind of lots of these things, but they're really, really small. So a really interesting dynamic is starting to emerge. Now, because of this data, and there's also, there's a, there's a layer that I won't go into the full details of um, regarding SegWit. Um, SegWit has a dual data structure. There's all the transaction data, you know, where it's going, how many coins are being sent, the UTXO. And then there's the witness data. And this is where inscriptions are being put inside of. This is the signature side of the equation. Now, because for a long story short, those, the data that's in that SegWit component, the signature component, it gets a discount in terms of how much you can put in there, essentially. Now, if we go back to our previous bull markets, this is typically when Bitcoin sees the maximum overall demand. So this is the number of transactions confirmed each day. And because the block is essentially capped in terms of its size, you can only fit so many transactions in. So at the bull market peaks and these periods of extreme euphoria and excitement and lots of things happening, the blocks are essentially full, and historically, we were getting somewhere, let's just say 400,000 transactions was the maximum per day. Well, because we can pack so many of these inscriptions in, particularly the text ones, that has been blown out. We got to 550,000, a significant increase, and we punched another one this week. So we have managed to fit far more transactions, and you can see the magnitude of this, right? This was kind of a, a law of physics until we found another way to pack more and more transactions into these blocks. Now, another way to visualize that same concept is the average number of transactions per block. So back in the day, we could fit something like two and a half thousand transactions per block. That's what would classify as a full block. Um, and in SegWit, that's basically 4,000 weight units. Again, I won't go into the full details there because it's uh, probably a bit too nuanced. But uh, just think about this in terms of the amount of available space. When a block was full, you had somewhere between 2,500 and 2,200 um, transactions. Well, we've again, we've blown that up by more than 50% of memory serves. Over 3.2, we got up to over 4,000. So we're almost doubling the amount of transactions that can fit in. But remember, this is all within the same block. It's the same construction of the block, but we can fit more of these things in because of the SegWit data structure and the way that these inscriptions are operating. Now, one dynamic that still probably needs a little bit of research and to understand is the expansion of the UTXO set. So remember UTXOs, and we have a great article which you'll find in the description below about what UTX are, uh, UTXOs are. If you're unfamiliar with that term, it is worth just brushing up on it. Um, and basically we use a gold coin analogy to help people understand. Um, but the UTXO is essentially, think about like a $50 bill or a $20 bill. And every time you spend it, that $50 bill is destroyed and it can be converted into however many bills of whatever denomination you want from that point onwards. So what we've seen is a ex massive expansion in the UTXO set. It's added about 46 million new UTXOs, um, which is a significant increase. And I mentioned at the start of this session that there was this BRC20 co token called SATs. Now this thing is essentially replicated. So there's one SAT for every SAT in the Bitcoin supply, which that means that for each mint, you could only mint one BTC or 100 million SATs. So what that means is that now that this thing is finished minting out, 21 million of this 46 million 
new UTXOs is associated with that single BRC20 token called SATS. So it's going to be very interesting to see where the mempools actually start to clear now that this this has been a major buy. This one inscription has been a major buyer of block space since February, more or less. So now that it's cooled off, this is where it kind of remains to be seen. Do inscriptions really have that stickiness? Now that, that, that I would say the wave two is now finished, where all those original BRC20s have been minted, we are now going to see whether inscriptions are a lasting phenomena um, or whether they were indeed just a period of excitement that, that disappears. We're going to find that out most likely in the coming months. Now, this is where things get really interesting. So just to summarize where we're at, these text-based inscriptions, or these BRC20s in particular, are very, very small in terms of their data footprint. We can fit lots of them in. So there's lots of them in the block, but they're kind of taking up the same amount of space as all the other transfers were uh, prior to them existing. So in terms of the proportion of fees being paid, wave one, when it was images, and wave two, when it's text, by and large, have been capped out at paying about 20% of the fees. So what that means is that all the transaction fees that miners have been earning, about 20% of them have been coming from inscriptions. Now, in terms of the overall size, remember the bytes in that block, note that images were quite significant. Let's just recall, if we go back to our previous chart, in terms of the transaction count, 5 to 7% were images and 40 to 60% were text, right? So just invert that number in terms of the overall size the actual bytes it's the exact opposite images were taking up 40 to 60 percent of the block whereas text is something like five to seven percent so again it's really reinforcing the the kind of smallness of these things in terms of their overall weight so one thing i just the analogy that i want you to take away here what we're really seeing is it looks as though these inscriptions are fairly fee sensitive. They don't particularly want to pay an overly high fee, particularly images, because they're paying on a per byte basis. So because they're quite large in terms of their size, they have to pay a large absolute fee. But what it really appears they are is they're almost like, imagine you've got a moving crate and all of the monetary transfers and all of the standard Bitcoin transactions, they are the thing that's being shipped in the crate. They have the most value, they sit inside that crate um, in the, and they take up the majority of the volume. So the majority of the volume and value is in the contents. That's the monetary transfers. These particularly text-based inscriptions are a little bit like the, the paper packing that you would put around the sides. You kind of put it into all of the remaining space. Anything that's left over that just hasn't been filled or there's a tiny little nook over there that we can stuff some of this stuff into... That is more or less what these charts are telling me about these text-based inscriptions. They are very much the buyer of last resort. They appear to be this kind of um, thing that you can packing around that block that just fills any final available space. And in many instances, it has to fill that space because you know all the contents, they're bulky, they don't quite fit. It's a bit like Tetris. You just need that tiny little block to fill that final space. That's very much how, from looking at this data, I am thinking about, particularly these text-based inscriptions. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Now, one way we can visualize this, and it may not be overly intuitive, but um, uh, I thought this was a, a nice way to frame it up. So when we look at means and medians in the Bitcoin environment, because of its positive skewness, and what I mean by that, most of the transactions that we have in Bitcoin are small, right? They're large in count, but small, much like these text inscriptions. And most of the large, you know, 100,000 million, multi-million dollar transfers, there's just not many of them, but they will represent the mean, right? Very large um, outliers on the upside will drag the average or the mean up, which is in the red. And very lo lots and lots of like small, typically retail, all those kind of daily transactions, they're going to really be in, um, reflected in medians. So if we look here, this is the transfer volume, mean in red and median in blue. So the average transfer volume kind of follows Bitcoin's bull and bear market uh, tendencies. And this is in log scale. So at the bull market peak, we were transferring over a million dollars on average. Pretty wild stuff. We're currently transferring $36,000 on the average transaction. And you can see we essentially put in higher lows and higher highs cycle after cycle. In many ways, the mean transaction size is more or less, I mean, it's going to be a little bit affected, but not by a great deal by all of these inscriptions. 
Now, for our medians, it typically oscillates at bull market peaks. It can reach about $1,000, $2,000. In bears, we get down to $100, $200, things like that. We're at $7.50 right now. So what's going on here is that these inscriptions are basically carried on what we call postage. It's like 10,000 sats, sometimes it's a couple of hundred sats. We're moving around cents and dollars for these inscriptions because obviously people have a perceived value of the thing that the inscription is based on. There is a value that goes beyond the 500 sats or the 5,000 sats that it's actually being moved around on. People perceive the value of the NFT, for want of a better term, or the token or whatever it is. So we can actually see this in the fee that's paid. Now, the way that I've calculated this, if you're transferring $100 and you pay a $1 fee, that's gonna be a 1% fee. So I'm looking at it in terms of the amount that's sent and the percent fee of what is being sent. Now, the mean or the average typically oscillates between 0.01% and a 10th of a basis point. We're talking about, you know, th these are the kind of numbers you would actually expect, right? Between one basis point and a 10th of a basis point. And that has been constant for pretty much all of Bitcoin's history. So that's well within expected limits. In bull market peaks, we have seen that typically it's been capped out at about 1.2%, 1% in the median. So this is kind of the peak urgency. People aren't really thinking so much about transaction fees. They just want to get their coins onto an exchange. At times like that, we get to like 1%. Most of the time it's around 0.1%. That's kind of the typical level. Well, note that particularly on that fee spike in March, we got up over 50% and we're currently at 10%. So what we're seeing is that people are willing to pay extremely high fees because they're only moving around 500 sats, but they believe that the value of the inscription is more than the sats that it's attached to. It's this really interesting dynamic where we're seeing UTXOs have a value that's actually not really measurable because it's an NFT or it's a token or it's, it's some more subjective component. So um, just, you know, really what these charts are doing is just helping present this, this kind of case that there is a bit of a shift here. We can certainly use our means to really assess what's going on in kind of the Bitcoin economy, the monetary transfers. But when we're thinking about inscriptions, we probably have to look a little bit more at the median because it's going to be really small, but lots and lots of them. So shifting gears, just to close this piece out, we're going to focus on the miners because as we look at this, what we're basically seeing is that there is a bit of an uptick in fees. They're, taking, they're paying about 20% of the fees. It's kind of like packing around the edges of the box. So now we really truly have very, very dense and full blocks. And it does remain to be seen now that this SATS uh, BRC20 is minted out, does this actually stand the test of time? Now, in terms of the actual impact on mining revenues, on the left here, the blue curve is the total amount of fees and the orange is the percent of the revenue that comes from fees. So high level, you can see that in bear markets, the fee market has historically gone to sleep. We're talking about something around 20, eh, 12 to 20 Bitcoin per day. Now we've seen it tick up to about 40 or 48, sometimes 50. So let's just say for argument's sake, it's roughly a doubling. So we've seen about a 2X, but it's still relatively small. We're still only talking about 40 to 50 Bitcoin per day, which, you know, the block reward 6.25. So we're talking about adding, eh, what is it, maybe six, seven, eight blocks in terms of overall uh, fee revenue. It, the percent that's coming from fees has historically bottomed around 1% of the overall, uh, um, overall reward. That's now jumped to 4%. So look, that's a meaningful uptick if you look at it from, you know, comparing one for one. But at the end of the day, if we are coming towards the end of the kind of mania phase, or at least wave two of inscriptions, what we've seen is that yes, they're adding positive free pressure. So it's a, it's a thumbs up, but it's not a five thumbs up, right? It's not get the crowd cheering. It's telling us that we've got a very, very light baseload buyer of cheap block space, but it's not really going to turn the tides in terms of minor revenue. Certainly not with a halving on the horizon. We have not doubled minor revenues. We haven't, you know, we've, we've literally put it up um, by a couple of blocks per day. Now, the tough case when it comes to miners is that in that time, since February, when inscriptions came out, hash rate is up 50%. So the competition fighting over this tiny little uptick in inscription revenue has, you know, we've added 50% to our overall mining, uh, uh, mining pressure. And if we look at it from a hash price perspective, this has to be the most brutal chart in all of Bitcoin. Um, this is an orange BTC reward per exahash. 
and in blue US dollars per exahash. Now this is in log scale and this thing goes down and down and down and down and we're in the process of breaking to new all time lows. So essentially per exahash on the network, miners are earning the least they've ever earned on both a USD and a BTC basis. Now, where this is really interesting, and this is not the, the place we'll go into the security budget, but what is fascinating to me is that our hash price, the reward per exahash is the lowest it's ever been, but our hash rate is at all time high. And what this is telling us is that miners still, even though there's a lot of concerns about the security budget and people talk about these things, the reality of the situation is that miners still have enough to both run their rigs and invest in more, newer, better, better infrastructure machines. We are still seeing CapEx investment in the mining cycle, um, which is driving that competition up. New rigs come online, new research and development for new ASICs comes online. Now we will, again, we will see how this plays out because uh, obviously with the halving coming, um, these dynamics continue to shift. Um, and certainly we can see that inscriptions haven't really moved the needle in a sustainable way uh, in terms of their fee revenue. But again, all of these things, it's the free market trying to work it out. So coming across and closing out with uh, minor pain points, right? Now with the halving, the halving is about 206 days away based on our current uh, block estimates. So how do we know where the stress points are for miners? Well, we've got two models that we're going to look at here. The first one is a simple log-log regression between difficulty and market cap. Why I like this model is, first of all, the, R, the, the, the correlation is 95% in terms of the R squared. Um, and really, everything in the mining world, from, you know, from the miner's salary to the power contract to the geographical location to, you know, all of the information known about mining is baked down to one, one number, difficulty. Difficulty is the price to mine Bitcoin. And what we've essentially done is said, well, let's correlate the market cap, which obviously is the USD, that's the perceived incentive for miners, by the difficulty, which is how hard it is to actually get it out of the ground, you know, for want of a better term. Now, that, with that correlation, we're looking for what is kind of the average. What is the middle? Where is the typical miner? What is that stress point of balance? And right now, it's at 24,000. So it's about a 7% premium where we currently are meaning miners are probably on the edge of their seats right now. We have another model which looks at it from how much um, issuance do you earn per unit of difficulty. So it's kind of like, what is the cost versus the reward? It's kind of another way to think about it. Now, this model uses a simple curve fit. So the red curve down the bottom here is the most efficient miners. It's curve fit to bear market bottoms. It's kind of telling us where is the survivor level. The miners that are super hardcore have the absolute best balance sheet and are ready to survive. What's an approximate cost for them? Well, now that we've got the most efficient miner, we can add our purple curve, which is the post halving most efficient miner. Well, that's currently down at 15,000 for the most um, efficient miners, which, you know, at 26,000, happy days, but that obviously jumps to over 30,000 which we are underneath. So if the Bitcoin price doesn't get above 30,000 and probably with a bit of margin to, to, to boot, we are most likely going to see some real stress enter the mining industry as we get closer to the halving. And once we go through the halving, there will be a lot of miners as the price hasn't appreciated that are probably going to be under stress. So uh, just putting a flag in it now, depending on how things are looking, we will certainly be revisiting this topic because I think the uh, the mining topic is certainly one a lot of people have interest in. Um, so we will explore this in more detail, certainly as we get closer to the halving, because that's uh, obviously where these things really come to bear. Um, and you can actually relate the middle, the ge um, geometric mean between these two is the orange. It actually trades very, very closely to our difficulty regression model. So you can almost use those two as a, uh, as a bit of a balance. So thanks for tuning in for that session, folks. Hopefully you found that useful and a little bit different. Um, my big takeaway from inscriptions is that they are net positive. They're kind of a cheap block space buyer of last resort. They're going to stuff around all the final edges and just completely fill the Tetris block. They appear to be willing to buy cheap block space. They're not, they don't appear to be displacing monetary transfers. So in that case, they're relatively benign. The question is, have they really moved the needle? They're positive, but have they really moved the needle in terms of fees? My assessment is not yet. Um, and are they going to be sustainable? Now that we've kind of seen the end of wave two, we will probably find out over coming months. So uh, something to think about, something to contemplate, and uh, hopefully have a great week. I'll see you in the next one.
Cheers.